it's Wednesday, December eleventh. Were uh, you calculating days in your mind? I don't. I just. I don't know where the month is going. It's like December eleventh already. That's insane. It's like it's twelve eleven or eleven twelve, depending on what. Kind, don't you hate that as a programmer? It's like you get a date and it's like eleven twelve twenty nineteen, and it's like oh, this is not enough information for me to know. Think about it. the most frustrating thing. YMD. I'll agree. I'll submit. To, I'll, I'll never agree to metric, but I'll agree to YMD as making more sense. But there are some customers who will not accept YMD output on anything. <laughs> it's so dumb. And the nice thing about YMD is that you get string sorting for free, basically, as long as you've always got leading zeros. But they're like, what is this communist garbage on my screen? <laughs> Change this to MDY. I'm like, okay. It's like, this is the computer scientists trying to save you from yourself. But you just learn to format it at output. Yeah. And leave it as YMD whenever you're dealing with it. That's... <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people can relate to what we're talking about right now. <laughs> so instead, let's talk about maybe the biggest shock for me for this week. I really expected this to go the other way, but there was a, a jury of his peers, even though none of those people were billionaires or expats. So were they really <laughs> anybody's peer? <laughs> Tesla boss Elon Musk wins the defamation trial over his pedo guy tweet. I think billionaires would have been even more likely to find in his favor. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, they would also be 100% likely to get out of jury duty. <laughs> it, was a, it was a technicality. They said that because the tweets didn't name Pedo Guy by name, they couldn't be sure who he was referring to. And so it didn't, it didn't meet the legal standard I for think, this. Didn't he tweet like three or four times, though? I doubled yeah. down on it. I mean, I think what happened was a lot of these people were like, oh, he's a hero. We can't, you know, <laughs> he, this is good for the world if he's better, if he's not, you know, punished for this or whatever. So, but this is apparently going to be kind of a case law thing now, right? So you could just go crazy on Twitter <laughs> and libel doesn't really exist if you word it correctly. They did rule that that guy was not famous too. So the threshold is much, much lower for the other guy not being famous. I gather that anybody on Twitter could probably go, call Elon Musk a, a a pedo guy as long as they're being kind of ambiguous about it but they would be much less likely to be able to get away with it if it was just some other random person that's what everybody should do is just in very mild ways just allude to the fact that elon musk is a pedophile <laughs> in every <laughs> communication that you have the subtle humor of that would probably be and, lost and by... just drive him crazy for the rest of his life let's try to let's try to make that a meme that elon musk is a pedophile and to turn the whole thing around on him. Because I think that would really, really piss him off. Because he's so worried about how the world sees him. Make yeah. that his legacy. Speaking of legacies, Mr. Pichai. Is that how you, I don't know how. Pichai? Pichai? The leader of Google got a bump up. Now, here's my question. If you're Sundar Pichai, are you not thinking to yourself... What the hell are they setting me up for here? <laughs> What's going on? I would be really worried if I were him. <laughs> uh, Variety has the headline, Google founders resign from Alphabet leadership. Sundar Pichai becomes CEO. Um, so that's Sergey Brin and uh, Larry Page. Uh, he Sundar has always been CEO, but is like co-CEO because Google was so big they have two CEOs. But uh, Well, he was CEO of Google. Yeah, but not Alphabet. Right. But now he's both. Right. So, um, I guess, was it Sergey Brin? I think that was that was he went on record as, as saying it's like, oh no, we've got everything under control. And that kind of thing. I was thinking about it from a different angle, which is the original founders of Google earnestly founding the company not to be evil, seeing what it has become today, or like, you know what, I'm just going to retire. I'm good. But you could use your power to rein it in, don't you think? Or you think they're trying to do that and failing? They they you know imagine a world where they tried to do that and have failed. Because now they need to make money and like the the honeymoon is over, as it were. Yeah. Uh, they also might see some of the, uh, the, the, the world is really turning on billionaires in a big way. And it is, I mean, there is an argument to make that like, you know, you control uh, an amount of power and resources that a thousand people could never use in a lifetime. Yeah no matter how opulently they lived. And yeah, that's kind of crazy, but 
eh, I mean, they did do something really impressive. I mean, they changed our world with Google <laughs> in a massive way. Who knew that an effective search engine could be so integral to daily life? I mean, you think about, go back to the 80s and go up to somebody and be like, you're going to have the entirety of human knowledge in your hand. <laughs> and you can use it anytime you want. And you can talk to it and get reasonable answers most of the time. And people are going to be like, okay, yeah, let's make that movie. That sounds hilarious. <laughs> so, mm, I don't know. It's a good argument, and it's not one that we have time to make here. But we can talk about when these big corporations become too powerful and they just do things to screw the consumer. And maybe we should prevent that. Maybe we wouldn't have to have butterfly keyboards if we lived in that world. Apple fails to stop a class action lawsuit over problematic MacBook butterfly keyboards. So Apple was saying, hey, we've got this replacement program where we're going to put a... Uh, a plastic bag over your your keyboard on the inside and that'll stop the debris from getting in and it's it's all you and your dirty dirty debris if you if you use this keyboard in the clean room it'll be fine it wasn't fine i need a keyboard that's compatible with pringles <laughs> i need a keyboard that's compatible with more than like six months of use it's just like the dead skin cells that come off of my hands well, maybe if you exfoliated properly, <laughs> you could be an Apple user. Otherwise, we don't want you. Yeah, that's the that's the general feeling, yeah. And, you know, speaking of people turning against billionaires, we have the whole climate thing going on, and people are really, they want to signal that they're doing good for the environment as they breed uncontrollably. <laughs> seems like a contradiction to me, but what do I know? But carbon, carbon is the enemy, and we must stop it. How can we stop it? Well, there's a, a novel new approach that Apple's getting into. Bloomberg has the article about Apple buying the first carbon-free aluminum from the Rio Alcoa Venture. So this is supposed to be clean aluminum. Will Apple be able to actually do anything useful with it? Soon we'll know. So apparently to make aluminum, you take, uh, was it steel? Or, or just straight up carbon, right? And you just bake it. And you bake off all the carbon and you end up with aluminum. Somehow they're using a, like a ceramic, right, for this one. Yeah. And it's zero carbon. And it's supposed to be cheaper, too. Hmm. Gotta wonder why everybody's not doing this. It's probably harder to make. It requires more cutting-edge material science. They claim you could retrofit existing aluminum plants, but I wonder how much effort would go into that. Record. A lot of effort. Yeah. They took away our headphone ports a couple, a couple years ago. And the people were outraged and the phone company said, yeah, whatever, shut up. Here's your dongle. Don't get out of line. And Apple is saying, we need to go further. <laughs> Four new OLED iPhones in 2020, iPhone without a lightning port in 2021. I'd never thought that Apple would be so opposed to USB-C. It's like, no, we will not put <laughs> USB-C on our phones. We'll do away with the port before we put USB-C on our phones. I wonder, are you going to have to have like a a mat that costs $200 to put these things into developer mode? Yeah. That's probably like the end game, right? Yeah. I mean, if, I know you're going to have to have a charging mat. But here's the other question. Will it come in the box? No. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a, a real, real sad moment for... What about that guy that traded his kidney? <laughs> he died. <laughs> but imagine if he got that and he didn't have his charging pad with it. And that's all the money he had in the world. So he can use it for six hours. That poor guy, he died. <laughs> no, um, I think that uh, it probably, it'll be like, uh, what was it? The, the One of the, I think it was one of the phones came with a charger, but it was like a slow mode charger. And you had to spend another 80 bucks to get a charger that could charge it quickly. Like the phone had the capability to charge quickly. It just didn't come with a charger that worked that well. That's mm. the thing that actually happened because Apple. And here's the other thing. You can use a phone while it's charging on a cable. You can't really use a phone while it's charging on a mat. No. Unless you're just like, you know, hunched over it. <laughs> That's a safety feature because of the radiation. You see the radiation that it puts out because it's charging and using the phone at the same time. Yeah, we got we got dinged by the F FCC. I'm sorry. I don't know what else we can do. <laughs> so you're going to have to use your slow mat unless you want to upgrade. And your slow mat takes eight hours to fully charge the phone. <laughs> So maybe that'll be good about keeping people's screen time controlled. You know, like we got too much screen time. <laughs> got to ration my use of the phone because I can't charge the battery quickly. Uh, well, Huawei, we talked about Huawei and uh, they're just, they're getting beaten down by these sanctions 
and it's really bad for them. But they have sort of hit a milestone when it comes to not doing business with the U.S. Huawei is now shipping smartphones with zero U.S. components. This is the Mate 30 Pro built using only stuff that they could get internationally outside of U.S. sanctions. Still running Android. Yeah. So. How long until the U.S. looks at this and is like, hey, Germany, stop doing this? I think, that, no, we already tried that with the U.K., but they were kind of like, eh. We did that with Iran successfully. Well, <laughs> it's easier to make a case against them. <laughs> genius I read this headline and I thought but who's the genius and I realized that genius is a website yeah. that does lyrics Yep. so those lyrics now if you google like song name and then the word lyrics google is smart enough to do it's like automatic <laughs> not even a search result I'm just going to print the lyrics for you oh it turns time. out it may not be automatic though well it's, it is but where did they get those from <laughs> Genius sues Google for no less than 50 million alleging anti-competitive practice over lyrics. So this is crazy to me because like when you license the lyrics, like that's a thing you have to license. You can't just publish them. When you license the right to publish lyrics from the music cartels, they don't actually give them to you. So Genius has a whole system set up for having users generate the lyrics and you get points for it and there's like a whole reward system. So it's user generated lyrics. But Genius added multiple layers of watermarking to their music. And this isn't the first time. Like Google was caught doing this and it was and it like it said genius in the thing and genius was like, Hey, stop doing that. Those are lyrics that we've generated which have some kind of copy protection, so don't do it. So they took the genius watermark out and just kept using the genius lyrics. How do we know? Because there's more than one watermark. They took out the watermark that uh, was obvious, but they left the non-obvious watermark. And so, because Google was basically treating Genius like they were insane, Genius is like, all right, we're going to sue them. $50 million. Yeah, it wasn't really a watermark. It was actually brilliant. It was genius what they did. <laughs> they used dots and dashes. So they would like hyphenate a word at the end of the line unnecessarily, or they'd put periods unnecessarily. And those dots and dashes, which can be used for Morse code, Spelled out red-handed. <laughs> and then genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Google's defense here is interesting. And I wonder, is will this hold up? They're saying, hey, we scrape lyrics from all kinds of places. And, okay, maybe we scrape lyrics from somebody who scraped them from you. But we didn't scrape them from you. <laughs> now, with what Google has tried to enforce in terms of copyright in the past... That's not going to fly, right? I no. mean, that's... <laughs> I stole from somebody who stole from you. That's not... It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it also shows that uh, Google is maybe not being the most honest here because uh, there were actually two hidden watermarks and they removed the one with apostrophes and they removed that one or they replaced quotes with apostrophes and vice versa and that, that spelled out red-handed and then the other one spelled out genius. And when they brought it to Google's attention, Google fixed the one with apostrophes, but they didn't fix the other watermark. Google being... Dishonest? I thought, no. <laughs> we don't live in that world. <laughs> but how, how crazy would it be, though, if Genius... Like, imagine if Genius used the G Suite internally. They couldn't talk about this kind of thing on G Suite because if Google's not going to be honest about that, they're going to probably go rifling through G Suite customer emails, right? That's a thing. Now here is, so I often like to think about what are anthropologists in the future, assuming the, the human race still exists, what are they going to think about us? Because we look back on uh, bloodletting, for example, <laughs> and it's like, what were those barbarians thinking? We're doing something like that right now. We don't know what it is, but we're doing it. <laughs> and I like to wonder, it's like, what is it going to be? I think this might be one of them. So <laughs> just think about this from a future anthropologist point of view right so these primitives for entertainment they watched this thing that caused the participants to suffer massive trauma <laughs> and none of them lived past a certain age and if they did they couldn't walk and they went crazy and they had dementia well, they would murder people and, and get away with it yeah <laughs> double murder and the answer that they came up with to, for that is not to stop doing the thing but to bring in AI <laughs> To try and study the problem. 
Uh, you can only be describing the article from Tech Republic talking about the NFL turning to Amazon for help addressing player injuries. So the National Football League is looking to Amazon to figure out how we can keep these players playing the game but also not get injured. Football is a rough sport. You're going to get injured. Well, yeah, they've proven that. The addition of the protective gear is what does it. So it's like it doesn't hurt enough to make you stop doing it, but cumulatively, it just destroys your brain. Yeah. So now here's so they're actually going to try to use machine learning and stuff. They're going to obviously we have high, amazing footage of these games down to every detail of the field, millimeter accuracy. And I guess they're going to try to run simulations. So when does this get into the realm of like sports betting, right? <laughs> you're going to have such amazing insight on the next week's game. It's like, oh, that's a stress fracture. He doesn't know it yet, but he's out. <laughs> he's out the next game. Put all your money on the other team. I can't wait for that. That's going to be a big scandal. <laughs> so last week we went to a restaurant and we stood in line for a long time. And there were a bunch of people just like loitering up front. And it's like, what are these people doing? get your drink and go to your seat. And then we ordered and we went to our seat and we waited and we waited and we <laughs> waited. And in turn, each of these people took out a massive cardboard box filled with stuff because they were all DoorDash drivers. And it's a weird world we're getting into because you actually have to compete with everybody who's eating at home if you go to a restaurant. NPR has the article on delivery only, the rise of restaurants with no diners as apps take orders. So, yeah. Our experience with was that with a, a usually pretty good service restaurant, the service was terrible, and it's because the restaurant usually has pretty good service because it's not that big. There's not that many people that will fit in there, and so they can take care of all the people that are in there. But when one person shows up and gets you know five people's worth of food, and that happens five or six times, the service is going to go down. So there are restaurants, uh, quote unquote. Is it a restaurant at this point? That's the question, right? And here you go. There's no place to eat here. There's no table. There's no service. There's no drink station. This is just a Chick-fil-A that exists to service DoorDash. Neat. We've entered the darkest timeline. <laughs> That's crazy. You think if you uh, like if you wanted it really badly, you could just sign up for DoorDash while you're in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to deliver this to myself. Well, how much before like we have uh, the DoorDash complex, like McDonald's. You know how like uh, uh, A&W and Long John's will like share a restaurant or like KFC and somebody else will like, you know, how long until there's like four or five franchises in one building no. that's only just for DoorDash? That's what they describe here. Yeah. the This this building right here. Oh, I DoorDash go Kitchens. Yeah, yeah. That has yeah. Diff several different franchises. I don't know if they are the big names though. Now, one guy in here talked about he tried to start one of those. So he built a building and he created like a pizza place and a burger place and, you know, some salads. And then, but it was all his, but he was just servicing DoorDash. And he said with the 30%, he couldn't survive. Hmm. He couldn't pay the DoorDash fee and still make money. Wow. So 30% is a lot. I mean, it's a big number to overcome. We talked about this in the last episode. I forgot to put this article in here, but SpaceX did it again. On its second attempt, SpaceX sends the Dragon soaring to the I ISS, and it made it. Everything is good. You think it's going to come back just filled with human feces? Yes. <laughs> they can't just throw. They can't just flush in space. It's got to go somewhere. Couldn't it burn in the atmosphere? Yeah, I think they do have. Uh, there's the one of the. I don't know if they put the the human feces on it, but. Uh, the, there is one of the disposal rockets and they, they put it in the thing and it does literally, it's designed to burn up in the atmosphere. So like all your waste in there, it burns up, but not all waste, I guess, can go in that. I don't know if the toilet waste is part of that or not. Oh man, how great would it be if there was a murder mystery on the ISS, if the weapon was in the burn pod? <laughs> you have no proof he was murdered. It's like, I do, but it's just in the pod. We're going to have to go EVA to retrieve it. Yeah, somehow you're going to have to do like reconstruction. It's crazy. <laughs> Somebody start writing that. Ericsson. We don't hear much about Ericsson because it's a Swift company, but we, we, they, they still sell their phones here, right? Is it Sony that they're with? Uh, I don't know. Swedish. Oh, is it Swedish? Swedish. I always, I always forget. So it's when Sweden <laughs> I'm like Krista. With, Krista the, the comments let us know. Krista, when she orders a drink, she 
it's Coke or Pepsi, but no matter what restaurant we go to, no matter how, how many times we go there, she always orders the wrong one. It's like you can set your watch to it. And that's how I am with Sweden and Switzerland. <laughs> anyway, Erickson had a bit of a problem with some, uh, some bribery. But they say, don't worry. We plan for this. It's in the budget. <laughs> Erickson to pay over $1 billion to resolve U.S. corruption probes. Now, this is bribes to lawmakers, not just in the U.S., but also all over. Um, it was, uh, I guess this was the U.S. Department of Justice thing. It's only $20 million in criminal complaints and then like another $920 million in fines and other stuff. But these were uh, bribes along the way. I mean, the, the way that you read what Erickson did here is Erickson is basically saying, this is just us doing business. This yeah. is the cost of business. I mean, yeah, this might have put some American companies at a disadvantage, but this is how business is done. And there are parts of the world where that is totally expected. Yeah. And companies... I've heard of companies that do business in those parts of the world, and they really they budget for that. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is the bribery budget. You don't go over this amount, but up until this amount, pay the bribes. The only reason they got punished is because the U.S. companies were at a disadvantage? I'm not sure what the takeaway here is. The takeaway is that the governments of the world are hopelessly corrupt. <laughs> Including ours. And then you look at uh, Ajit Pai, and you say, oh, wait. <laughs> it's just a different kind of bribery here. <laughs> We're just a little bit more civilized about it. There's probably not an envelope full of cash, but maybe there is. Who knows? There's the promise of an envelope full of cash after you leave the thing that you're doing. Well, it's not. It's direct deposit. Oh, okay. I'm sure he doesn't get paid in cash. <laughs> Amazon. Amazon Echo, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. Do you think we've reached saturation here? Yes. Do you think they're still, I think they're still selling but not as much. Yeah, because everybody, the novelty has worn off. And they keep releasing new Echoes. Now, what do you think the upgrade rate on an Echo would be? I think that's got to be low. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think there's any really compelling reason to buy a new one. Right. I think that some people might buy like the home speaker thing because they want to experience, you know, a better stereo at home or something. And uh, maybe they get a free, the Echo functionality comes along for the ride for that. So when we talk about Apple... And we talk about uh, the gaming companies. We talk, Steam, did you see the Steam is not allowing Hong Kong games on Steam Direct? Really? Uh, I didn't see that. So when That's these surprising. companies you can bend over backwards for these other markets, this is why. Because you're not going to sell that many more Echoes in the U.S., but guess where you can? In a first, Amazon launches a battery-powered portable Echo speaker in India. So it's a like a 4,800 milliamp hour battery. It's going to last like, what, six, eight hours? It's a That's pretty chunky battery. Six, eight hours of constant music, they say. Yeah. So. And the Indian people apparently were crying out for this because what they want to do is they want the music on all the time. They want to go from room to room with it. And not have 17 echoes. Yeah. Right. So. Interesting. It's an interesting use case. It says a lot about Americans when they're like, I must get an Echo for every room. Does anybody do that? I don't think anybody does that. I don't know. Of course, the number of comments we get from people, like when we say say things and trigger their, their assistance. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I always, when I read those comments, it's like, oh, my opinion of you just lowered. <laughs> and you're already in the YouTube comments, so uh. we're, we're, we're digging into bedrock here. So, uh, speaking of companies that aren't really setting the world on fire with sales... Remember Magic Leap? No one does. Magic Leap's early device sales aren't looking good. So Magic Leap, that was the augmented reality. Remember they had the really impressive demo? And then the demo <laughs> was the demo less... The demo was terrible. Well, the first the demo was impressive. Rock. Yeah. No, the no, one well, with the whale was nice. The, yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. And then the rock. The rock, the rock came was, later. <laughs> the rock, the rock was, was not good. good. Well, they were going to sell a million units. They sold 2,000 units. Yeah. It was... Uh, or 6, oh, 6,000 for 2,300 a piece. Yeah. 2,300 for this thing. They I spent, mean, spent a billion dollars. You could probably get uh, a PC and an Oculus or a Steam VR, right? Yeah. For that price. This is crazy. <laughs> so he actually tempered his expectations after the. He came out with a million statement, and the board was like, What are you saying? No, no, not that. And he was like, Oh, 100,000. So. Even at a hundred thousand expectation, the lowered expectation, they've sold six. Thousand. But they're going to go ahead and do another round of funding because <laughs> this is going to pick up. 
<laughs> well, I guess for the investors that have invested a billion dollars, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, right? I think uh, the phrase you're looking for there is throwing good money after bad. <laughs> Smart investors are not supposed to do that. <laughs> so uh, the next round of uh, game consoles is on the horizon, and we had some rumors. <laughs> oh, about it's a pun. Horizon. Because uh, uh, Ryzen. Because AMD. Because they all have AMD processors. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. There were rumors that the uh, the Xbox was going to be kind of like a, a split platform for this next one. But then Xbox was like, no, we've just got Project Scarlet, and that's all we're announcing at this time. But now there are more rumors from Kotaku that says, no, the cheaper version is still alive. Sources say that Microsoft is still planning a cheaper, diskless, next-generation Xbox. Don't know if it's going to be an Xbox. Might be a home hub. I don't know. This is all just rumor. We don't know. There's there's some details. Lots of speculation in the article. This is getting a lot of buzz. I don't. Well, the good news is now you're really not going to own your games. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're all going to be digital and they're going to turn off the marketplace. Would it be too much to ask to get some interoperability? Like imagine a version of this is a set top box that runs Windows 10 that you could stream your your Steam games to, but you could also stream your Xbox games to. Oh, no, 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 because they're going with their yeah. storefront. As, again, none of these companies actually want to give the consumers what they want. They just want their own garbage. Yeah, I got to admit I'm doing the $5 yeah. Xbox thing. I mean, it's a good deal now. When they raise the price, it's probably not going to be a good deal. So, mm. moving on to social media, we you often hear about how Facebook rolls out these numbers, and they're like, "Look at all these people. We'd figured out these are fake accounts. They're trolls and they're spammers, and we wiped them out." And the numbers are big. Yeah. And you think, "Wow, you can lose that many people just from fake accounts? That's amazing. You must have gotten them all." Well, according to Ars Technica, not the case. Social media platforms leave 95% of reported fake accounts up, a study finds. Fake accounts are easy to buy and make, and platforms are bad at yanking them. So even if you have somebody that is reporting an account as fake, 95% of the time, it's going to stay up. How does Ars Technica know this? How, how do you measure this? Well, they bought a bunch of fake accounts. I think they spent, what, like two grand? Yeah. It turns out this is a really popular thing in, in ad agency circles mm -hmm. as well. It's like they'll do a, a campaign, which is just a catastrophic failure, and then they will buy a bunch of accounts on, on YouTube or Facebook or wherever to like, and then those people just disappear forever. So they bought likes, follows, and uh, actual accounts. And they you know spent the, the money, they did the campaign, and then they noticed that those, they weren't going away. They were still there. And so they told Facebook about it. And Facebook was like, oh, okay, yeah. And then they deleted some small amount of them. And then they actually went and rounded them all up and sent them. as like, no, these accounts are <laughs> fake. We bought them. And Facebook deleted 5% of them. Because their numbers would look bad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their end of year. There's a, there's a strong disincentive for correcting those kinds of issues, let's say. And you got to think at those percentages... The numbers would be staggeringly bad. Yeah. So. We have, uh, we talked about the facial recognition thing. If you are not a U.S. citizen and you come to this country, you are going to get face scanned. But that's kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how you'll be, the, the invasive things that they'll do to you. And maybe one of the craziest ones is they expect you to list all of your social media accounts and they're going to go back and look at all your tweets and your Facebook posts and see if anything looks out of the ordinary. And a lot of people, myself included, think that's insane. <laughs> Filmmakers are suing the State Department over social media surveillance rules. Account disclosure requirements create a digital surveillance regime. It's like, we're not going to post anything to social media if we know somebody in the State Department is going to be looking at it, basically, is what the filmmakers say, which is tantamount to free speech curvature. It is a chilling effect. And they do talk about, uh, remember the one case where it was the guy's friend made like a little bit terroristy post and they were like, nope, nope. going home because your buddy might be a terrorist. <laughs> yeah. The final resolution in that was he's still at home. Mm. And when we talk <laughs> about the FTC, you can count on the FTC to get to the bottom <laughs> of the matter. They will figure it out. They'll go in there they'll find the facts <laughs> 
and they will punish the people accordingly. Uh, it might take them five years to do it. And by the time they find it, the problem might have already solved itself. <laughs> but they'll do it. <laughs> this article is unintentionally scathing, and it's amazing. Reuters has the headline, The US FTC finds that Cambridge Analytica deceived Facebook users. There's a lot of words here, but I, I can just cut to the chase for you. The author of this article was like, so how, how are you going to enforce that? Because Cambridge Analytica is defunct, and what does this ruling actually mean? And the FTC told the author of this article at Reuters, we'll get back to you. But who was still <laughs> defending Cambridge Analytica? Who thought that they didn't deceive Facebook users? I don't think that there was any defense here. I just think that finally the, the FTC was like, all right, you know what? Let's just put this one to bed. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> what I'm saying is, who is this report supposed to convince? It's December. We already knew. Like, it's December. It's, we're closing the year out. I'm going to go into 2020 with a fresh thing. I'm going to get all my old to-dos <laughs> done. So he's like, I've had this little red <laughs> event here in my calendar for too long. Let's just clear that one out. <laughs> I've, I've done some Googling. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Cambridge Analytica was not good. Case closed. <laughs> I, I have the reading comprehension of a four-year-old, and I can still tell that Cambridge Analytica <laughs> deceived Facebook users. So let's just wrap this one up. Keep in mind, this is the same FTC that's supposed to protect us from the ISPs, which are doing really, like, not... It's very subtle. Well, to be fair, though, they're not supposed to be protecting us from them. The FCC <laughs> is supposed to be protecting them from us. They're getting even more. Think about how slow these guys are. And now they're getting more work piled on top of them. Isn't that a bit like asking the Navy to fix the fighter jets? I mean. You're going to get comments. It's like, bro, the Navy has an air program. <laughs> Yeah, I guess they got the aircraft carriers. Oh, that's no, that's 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 a whole other rabbit hole. It's like, did the people that work on the aircraft carriers also service the planes, or is there an air force, you know, unit on an air no, no, aircraft no. carrier? No, no, the navy has has their own has their own air. Yeah, yeah. Wow, the airmen. Yeah, I thought they worked together. I thought that was a joint operation. Well, they have different kinds of planes. What are we going to do? Use cases. What are we going to do? Joint operations with the space force. Yeah, that's funny because like space force. Will we have a different... If you fly to another planet and land, are those the regular Marines you're landing? <laughs> space Marines. <laughs> or are they Space Force infantry? That's a good question. Engage. Facebook. So Facebook, of course, their big thing is ads, right? They're selling you ads, and they've taken a lot of flack for kind of being asleep at the wheel on the ads. <laughs> And here's just another instance of that. <laughs> Facebook sues Chinese malware operator for abusing its ad platform. Facebook sues I Like Ad and two Chinese nationals for using Facebook ads to trick its users into downloading malware. So mostly they're just suing the two Chinese nationals because I Like Ad, not really technically a U.S. company, I guess. I don't know. It, didn't, it wasn't really super clear on that. Can you buy Facebook ads yeah, just as an individual. That's what they were doing. So, like, the two Chinese nationals had written software so that they they ran some ads. And when you would click on the thing from the ad, you would get the malware. But then that malware would let them buy Facebook ads through their company, but with the identity of the people they'd taken over. So, it's like a malware virus. Like, you know, your, your grandma clicks the link, she gets the software, and now all of a sudden grandma's buying Facebook ads? Well, I mean, that's that doesn't arouse suspicion where like you know the chinese uh buying the ads directly somebody but, might be suspicious of that but you still have i guess because the ads were, were coming from i like ad is why they've wrapped them into it yeah it seems yeah. like they could deny it all yeah. day long no no it was, it was like you still have to have the content of the ad and so it's like oh this is this is an ad that contains malware for more malware so that we can run other kinds of ads and that was the commonality so as the populace gets more and more woke to the evils of big data and the big tech companies, and you have all these congressional hearings, and I, I think it's pretty common knowledge now that Mark Zuckerberg is kind of an evil robot, right? <laughs> and so that's going to come up at the Thanksgiving table or when you're meeting, you know, it's, this is the, the time of year we're all with our families. Don't you work for Facebook? Should you be working for Facebook? Yeah. So if you work for Google or you work for Amazon, not in the warehouse, but you know, like in the corporate or you work for Facebook, what do you say? How do you defend the undefendable? Well, good news. <laughs> Facebook gives workers a chat bot to appease that prying uncle. 
The Liam bot teaches employees what to say if friends or family ask difficult questions about the company over the holidays. This is, like, I'm not even upset. This is the darkest timeline. This is actually kind of amazing. And this is just such corporate <laughs> nonsense speak. It's uh, working on AI to spot hate speech. It has hired more moderators. Those moderators are super <laughs> depressed, though. Facebook consults with experts on the matter. Regulation is important for addressing the issue. I mean, that one is the, the emptiest one of all of them. Can you imagine, like, you say that at the Thanksgiving table, and they're like, what the hell does that mean? And then you're just like, oh, God, Liam didn't prepare me for this. Follow-up questions. I think they might have used a beta version of this on the Senate testimony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was what they put into Mark Zuckerberg that day. And they're like, just dump that and give it to the employees. That's the one where they forgot the blink routine. It's like, don't forget to blink. And the water consumption, <laughs> it timed out too quickly because he takes those little tiny sips. Well, you talk about the, the, you know, the moderation people and the hell that they have to go through. And we've talked about this before, but it just keeps popping up because watching murder and rape and just the, the worst part of humanity all day long really does screw you up, it seems. <laughs> Ex-Facebook worker claims disturbing content led to PTSD. This is in Ireland, so it's going to court. And I bet the court case... What do you, what do you think the over-under is that Facebook will just pay this person millions of dollars to make this not go into the court system because the information that will be made public as part of the court proceedings will be super... It'll be far beyond any of the terrible darkness that we've contemplated. Uh, so a couple of examples here. Well, I think the, the chances are really good to answer your question because... You know, the EU is just chomping at the bits. And you want to make sure this doesn't get... The regulators don't get a whiff of this. And a big, <laughs> ugly court battle means the regulators might like, Oh, oh, do you need us to fine you again? Because we'll do it. But here's some of the examples. It's uh, a woman wearing an abaya is being stoned to death. Uh, migrants in Libya are tortured with molten metal. Jesus. And footage of dogs being cooked alive. He went further and he said, for example, the woman being stoned to death, right? You kind of always be like, oh, I just don't, I don't want to see that, right? But no, you can't do that because when you're doing your flagging, you have to make determinations about the video. It's like, okay, this is a death, so we're definitely going to take it down. But is this also terrorism? So you have to kind of look at who's doing the stoning. Are there any flags in the background? No, this is a purely religious stoning. Yeah, okay. Maybe this is just an honor killing. Maybe it's terrorism. And you have to make all these decisions. And you have to watch a thousand of these per shift. Now, of course, uh, pro tip. Don't take that job. Jesus. Get a different job. I, we talked about this before. Do you think there's some personality type that could just breeze through this and not even care? I mean, they're probably running companies, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sunder, they don't. Sunder they don't. Pichai. They don't need the job. They're already. <laughs> it's already. They're the. They're the people that created the need for that job in the first place indirectly. Oh, yeah, I suppose. WeChat. So uh, WeChat is the international version of the same software that, that started in China. It's called something else in China, but it is. Is that Tencent? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it's Chinese owned. And there's always been this question of how much control does the Chinese government have over WeChat? And maybe we have another piece to the puzzle here. TechDirt reports that the American WeChat users are getting banned for celebrating Hong Kong election results. In a nutshell, the WeChat company Tencent responded, and it's like, we're, we navigate very difficult uh, you know, international <laughs> regulation mar uh, regulations. And that's, that's, really, that's really it. I, I can't help but imagine, like, when the gangs force you to stab somebody in prison and then you know, like they're interrogating you and they know that you were forced to stab somebody and you know that you were forced to stab somebody, but you can't say that you were forced to stab somebody because then they'll stab you. <laughs> so everybody's just pretending that we don't know what's happening here. But we all know what's happening here. Yeah. Now, we reported on something similar last week with TikTok where, like, the girl was banned and then unbanned and then banned again. And then it got a lot of attention and she was unbanned. That was about the Uyghur yeah. concentration camp. This follows almost exactly the same pattern. It's a whole other company. Hmm. But the weird thing about this one is, like, the Uyghur stuff was hidden. At yeah. least up until last week. Yeah. She was sort of, like, blowing a whistle there. 
everybody knows about Hong Kong. I well, mean, that's right in your face. I'm also thinking about Apple's changes over the last few years, like the removal of VPN software from the thing, and then taking down the news apps, and then the police app thing more recently for and Hong Google. Kong. Google's done it as well. Yeah, and so there's a lot of American companies that are like, oh, we can't do business there? Oh, cool, we can comply with these local things. It's fine. Dot, dot, dot. By the way, VPNs are not allowed. Why, why aren't VPNs allowed? No. Security. Wasn't Tim Cook saying something about blah, 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 FBI encryption? Oh, it, yeah, they had that whole... God, that was such a it's ridiculous like, thing. It only matters when it's America. When it's some other country doing terrible things to its citizens, we don't care. Well, you do kind of have to... I mean, if you're going to say that we're above the law and we make our own rules, we'd throw you right out, right? And China's just basically playing the same game. Mm-hmm. But, you know... From a moral perspective, what you should do is be like, we don't agree with that. We're not going to do business in China. But <laughs> they're, they're not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Apple is one of the few companies that might have the the social clout that, like, if the citizens demand it, China might have to deal with that. I don't think so. Really? No. I, th- I think if, if China, if Apple were like, we're going to actually do this legit and we're going to allow VPN stuff in for users of apple stuff in china and we're going to make it harder for the great firewall to do stuff by hardening our operating system and and actually legit making our encryption amazing and and impenetrable if 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 he just if tim cook just does the stuff that he said that he wanted to do versus the fbi in america but in china i think they have the clout to be able to do that and get away with it and plus the people would probably be even more interested in in having apple products yeah i see i think you're way off base on that i think Having an Apple product would make you a target. And those people <laughs> understand that. They know what it's like to live with that. And they're just not going to do it. They can't kill all of us. And then it was like, oh, well. Uh, they don't have to kill all of you. they got to kill like 15 20%. And then the rest will get in line. That's the, that's the way it works. <laughs> Truly the darkest timeline. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a, if you are a programmer in the modern day, and you know, I, I started, I got interested in it. I guess right around the time the internet came into being. But there was no Stack Overflow in those days, right? You would actually have to go and buy books. But then you got to think, even we don't know what it was like for those guys, you know, in the 80s. Yeah. Because they had nothing to do. No, they couldn't Google it. They got an error code that was just a number or, you know, a hex. Your only option was to reason through it, yeah. which is impossible. And so it's hard to think, like, what did we do without the internet? And then a lot of other things, you know, every time something goes wrong in my house, write to YouTube. <laughs> Show me how to fix this. And it's a super amazing tool for figuring those things out. I mean, you will learn how to do, how to take your washing machine apart, whatever. Whatever you got to do, it's an amazing tool. But are there some jobs <laughs> that shouldn't do that that's the question <laughs> doctors are turning to youtube to learn how to do surgical procedures but there's no quality control said cnbc in a darker timeline yet than i was alluding to <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right it's like you need some surgery done yeah let's learn how to do that surgery from youtube now one doctor gave an interesting example and this is kind of a gray area right because they have all these surgical tools and they're so complex and he was like They bought this new thing. I didn't know how to use it. So I went to YouTube, figured out how to use it. Now, to perform the actual thing, maybe he already knew how to do that. But now he's got this new tool, and he needs to know how to run that. I'm kind of okay with that one, I think. Maybe. I can see some of the old school surgeons. Like, normally we just crack your chest open, but we got this newfangled thing where we go in through a pea-sized incision and robots do it on the inside. Lacroscopic stuff. And it's like, okay, maybe. I mean... Well, then maybe there should be a training weekend. <laughs> <laughs> they get a couple of pig cadavers in the ER. But they also talk about, it was uh, the, like there's one video that is, what was it? It was like a removing something. A cyst, I think. And it had millions and millions of views. And why would anybody be watching that unless they needed to remove a cyst? <laughs> Some people are morbid like that. Krista's fascination with like monsters inside me. Remember, she guess, she would be yeah. good because she was really upset when they took monsters inside me off of Netflix or something. And it was you know look at this thing living under my skin or like those flies that like burrow under your skin. There was a lot of videos of that and those had millions of views. And it's just like I don't ever want to see that. You can't unsee some things. I guess, but does are there millions of those people yeah. all watching one video? Apparently, maybe we can recruit some. Maybe Google can use the analytics of those to find out who can go to work for Facebook watching the other stuff, or which of those are coming from a hospital. 
You know, they got the op- he said the surgeon's just in the toilet of the hospital. It's like, <laughs> oh, I got to figure this out. I got ten minutes. But now the guy who said this guy talks about it's like, yes, I did this a bunch of times as a doctor. Everybody does it, but he's starting a training company that mm. does it by video. Handy. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's probably good to have that as a resource after you learn the traditional way to do it and practice and like go to a surgical theater and watch a live person do it. It would probably be cool to be able to practice that kind of stuff on, uh, on pigs or artificial things and stuff. You think that, uh, we'll start growing. Like we've got the word to the point where we can print livers and, and skin grafts and stuff. seems like that would be a good thing to practice on. It's like grow some skin with stuff that's got to be removed and then have surgeons practice on that. What about this Twitch for live surgery? <laughs> Surgerytwitch.tv. <laughs> I mean, if you're an amazing doctor, not only are you helping other doctors because they can watch your live amazing surgeries, but you're getting you know bits the entire time. That's like, gonna that's gonna be a thing that happens. Like, that's an incredible incision. Can you imagine like if PewDiePie got kidney stones and you could watch the live removal? It's like okay, we're gonna go in and like remove the thing. Shatner well, sold. No, I'm thinking it's the surgeon's channel. Oh, like you're a rock star surgeon. Hmm. And I'm a doctor, and I want to watch your techniques and chat with other doctors. Well, I mean, Shatner sold his kidney stone to goldenpalace.com for like $60,000. I thought that was like biohazard medical waste. Uh, it's, it's Shatner's. No, no, they actually, they gave me mine, now that I think about it. <laughs> they gave it in a little glass tube. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that could be a thing. I'm that's, thinking it's going to happen with one of the big Twitch streamers at some point. I'm thinking doctor.twitch.tv is, <laughs> you know, I mean, like you got a surge and like you go in and it's like, don't worry, we have the number one uh, surgeon on Twitch at this hospital. I'm yeah. not sure that would instill confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I want that. You know, it's like the online personality doctor, it's like <laughs> the, the doctor disrespect as like a surgeon. That would be not, not cool. <laughs> you imagine like, it's like, all right, we're getting ready to close. What's our viewer count? <laughs> Let's make things more interesting. Let's drop a liter of blood. I'm not I'm not closing this up until I get twenty subs. Let's start a sub chain. <laughs> oh uh, that's it for today. What do we got for Friday? Uh what's left? Security and nonsense. Neat. See you Friday. Mm-hmm.